Okay, we're good. Okay, go ahead, Nadia. Okay, uh, uh, I would like to make uh, uh, a point that uh, uh, all uh, the, the the study the, in the risk assessment will depend very much on the type of the chemicals or the material that we investigate. Uh, for instance, in the cancer, we, we have new material every day, new uh, chemotherapeutic material every day. And the studies that were done on those materials are very limited, so you can't use the statistical data, or there is no data at all. So don't you think that we have, when we say, this is what we use, but will depend on what we are investigating? Um, yeah, but I think um, I think for cancer there are there are two there are two studies that are required. I think one in the rat and one in the mouse. Uh, which are? Um, let me see if I can. Uh, let me just get the thumbnails up here and uh, see if I can see which one. Yeah, there. Yeah, on, on this slide, I don't know if that's. Can you guys see that one? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, I, so, I know that you know, the, most of the studies are depending on uh, the type of immune response. How that's how they calculate it. But what I'm trying to emphasize is the chemical under study uh, will change the material and the host uh, that you use for your test. If it's in red, it gives you this material even within red. In female, the, the, the results would be different than male. Right. Uh, and right. in rabbits, you can get highly positive results. Then when you test it with red, or you test it with any other animals, you got totally different material. Right, right. Yeah, they used to have a, a classification. Um, I think it was like, the, I think that the C classification was one animal, and then B was two animals, and I think A was where they had uh, epi data indicating, you know, human carcinogenicity. Um, and the other thing about the accused, I wanted to emphasize that it doesn't have to take one day. It depends very much on do, dose. If it's all overwhelming dose within a few minutes, you can right. get the acute toxicity. Right. Hey, Jeff, yeah. you know, with the carcinogenicity studies, too, depending on the results in the rat and the mice studies, we will often have to do or decide to do mechanistic studies right. to see if there is a relevance from what you're seeing metabolically in the rat or the mouse with humans. So depending on how clear or ambiguous the results are, additional work that's not required is often done too. And HED then will do away to evidence. Yeah. I think we could probably do um, at least a whole day on these two days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much in there. but. Um, okay. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. The, uh, I think we have one question before we get started back in. Sure. Is that right? Okay, we'll go back to, yeah, we're, we're recording. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and uh, get back to your where you were, and I think we have another question. Yeah, we have one question from Bernie. Bernie, uh, can you go ahead and star six your phone, please, and uh, ask your question? Bernie, are you available? Did 
you have your phone mute, mute button push, you may have to un push that. I would read his question, but it only comes up half the question, so we only got there. half the question, so okay. So let's go ahead and go ahead and proceed, and then we'll pick up later. Okay, so all right, so back to it. Um, now, um, uh, I guess the final uh, word on, on cancer, um, it's rather than an MOE uh, approach, it's really expressed more as a risk um, where you'll have a Q star, it's a 95th it's percent confidence on a slope, and it's, you know, it's basically um, a way to uh, model extra cancer risk over background. And so uh, what you'll see in an assessment is you, you still go about assessing the, the daily exposure um, the way you would for the uh, subchronic effects, uh, but then you, you consider things like uh, days worked per year where you're exposed to that substance and then years worked in a lifetime, and then the, uh, the, the dose gets expressed as uh, a cancer risk of you know, one in one in a 10,000, one in a 100,000, one in a million, and really depending on um, the risk managers and the various decisions, um, they're going to decide at what, at what uh, level of risk um, is uh, what makes sense for a given chemical. Um, obviously, one in a million is uh, the most desired or even better. So. Um, to get into the, the handler assessment then, so that's, that's, that's what's done by the toxicologists and the risk assessment team. They, they evaluate that whole database and they find the points of departure that make uh, the most sense to uh, use in the risk assessments uh, based on the, the worker uh, expected uh, frequency and duration of exposures. So um, obviously a key thing to uh, the Occupational or handler exposure is, uh, you know, what the labeling is a, is a key source of information that's got all your existing PPE, um, defines the scope of our assessments. So if you know the types of crops, you know the types of equipment that are being used, um, you know the formulations because you have the labels. Um, <clears throat> we'll evaluate them using exposure monitoring data that are um, conducted under a number of circumstances. Um, we have lots of scenarios which are used uh, generically, and, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and so we, again, we come to our conclusions, we present the risks, and uh, we identify potential risk management solutions. Uh, we recommend, but uh, we're not the risk managers, although there are days when it feels as if you're all of them. So. Uh, Part of the uh, handler assessment is, of course, the application rate, which is on the label. Uh, the maximum label uh, rate is what's used. You know, it's kind of we're like licensing, so uh, they have to defend the maximum use that's on a label. Um, and so we need to know how much they use, and so uh, we have uh, estimates of acres treated in per day, um, amount of gallons spray per day, standard values from data and surveys that we'll use. And then uh, we use the unit exposure, which is a contact factor per amount of pesticide used um, for dermal and inhalation routes uh, that we we'll use from surrogate databases. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, the pesticide handler's exposure database uh, or the new one. I think uh, Kurt and some other folks from the Ag Handler's uh, Exposure Task Force, which are developing the new database, gave a presentation, I think, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and so that's a new database that um, will be uh, vastly superior to the one that we have now. Um, so again, the idea is that handler exposure is uh, less dependent on the specific chemical that you may be handling. It's more about the physical process of applying or mixing and loading. Think of, think of pouring a liquid into a bowl versus getting a, a bag of flour and pouring it into a bowl. Uh, the type of exposure is largely driven by, you know, the physical nature of the, of the powder versus the liquid. Uh, likewise, with the uh, various handling equipment, there may be patterns of exposure that are really more specific to the, the process of uh, making an application to an orchard or uh, making a handheld spray in a greenhouse that's a lot more 
um, generic in that sense than um, the specific chemical that you're applying. Now, again, this is for standard pesticides with, you know, low vapor pressures, uh, things like fumigants. I mean, that's a whole other day. That's a whole other concept. And everything that I've told you is probably pretty much out the window when it comes to uh, as far as how we would go about that assessment. And so here's just some examples. Here's the air blast equipment, a treatment in an orchard. And so you can see the exposure might be largely overhead. Um, and so, you know, an open situation like that, so the pretty high exposure situation, uh, is obviously mitigated by the use of the cab. So you can imagine those having different contact values uh, based on the amount of pesticide you might be using. Um, ground boom, again, uh, different kind of exposure pattern, perhaps more uh, lower body exposure versus the upper body exposure you might be seeing in that orchard situation. Um, again, uh, enclosed cabs is a good way to go if feasible. Uh, of course, there are serious costs involved, and that's something that might be uh, considered for risk managers. Uh, then again, if it's a, a crop in which uh, that kind of equipment is used uh, readily anyway, uh, that also factors into the decision. Um, again, handheld equipment we have factors for. That's a whole different kind of uh, exposure pattern. And here's a rights of way situation where uh, you're just kind of running along, dragging hoses and uh, spraying uh, plants randomly. So um, the goal is to have as many um, uh, exposure uh, variables, contact values to use in the assessments uh, from as many different people doing as many different things as possible. Um, here's just some examples of. Um, uh, mixer loader, and there's, uh, you know, the, the classic dumping the bag directly into the spray tank. Um, and, of course, you would imagine that the exposure would be different by using a, uh, a water-soluble packet that has either a wettable powder in it or a dry flowable. So um, on to the types of data. This is uh, much, much older data, um, and this is a situation where life imitates art. Um, the the little cookie monster on the left there is uh, from our guidelines, and the, and the photograph on the right is myself a couple thousand years ago. Um, but that's the older style of doing studies where you had patches representing uh, various parts of the body. Um, the good part about uh, those where you could uh, have maybe layers of patches uh, beneath typical worth clothing. Um, you can see uh, an old impinger there uh, rather than the uh, OVS tube. Um, the, the uncertainty involved in using this is that the spray could go there and you would extrapolate it to the whole body, um, or the spray might end up on a part that wasn't captured by the patch. So uh, there's been a, a great uh, departure from the uh, use of uh, patches uh, uh, described in the seminal work by German Wolf uh, to the use of whole body dissymmetry, which uh, the, the new task force is using to uh, develop their uh, um, uh, exposure data. Uh, again, those patches would be uh, extrapolated to um, surface areas uh, for a typical person. Um, and that's something that we don't really have to do too much anymore, but that's, uh, that's a big feature of the pesticide handler exposure database where it was most of the data in there is based on patches. Um, so what they use now is they'll use uh, cotton uh, garments, uh, long underwear and cotton uh, long uh, shirts. Uh, that's going to be your skin. Uh, so they'll measure the residues that are uh, collected on those based on someone doing a typical activity. Um, those can be sectioned in a number of ways. Uh, as you can see with that handheld equipment, you would be interested in knowing and what's the difference uh, between the upper arms and lower legs. Um, so that can help uh, inform some uh, uh, risk mitigation strategies. Uh, <clears throat> you'll have a situation where they're just going to maybe measure the upper and lower body, and that would be in situations where um, you're looking at closed systems, and so you're probably not all that interested in uh, sectioning out the dissimilars as much. Um, I hope this comes out okay for everybody, but this is um, this, this is kind of like real life. This is uh, uh, the use of a tracer study to um, 
uh, sort of inform exposure. And this is um, this is somebody you know who had worn gloves, a shirt, and coveralls, and um, it, you know using that stuff doesn't mean you're not going to get anything. And so the goal is for us to have um, good data that um, has measurements underneath um, clothing. So, um, you know, even if you have gloves, um, coveralls, all this stuff, stuff still gets through, either through it or around it, through seams or openings, things like that. So um, this is just a really nice example of an exposure pattern to the forearms and hands, which is pretty common for a lot of uh, mixer loader scenarios in particular. Um, and here's um, the back of the neck. Um, this person was an air blast applicator, and there's a situation where, um, you know, a good way to reduce risk is probably to have either a closed cab or uh, chemical resistant headgear. Um, other methods for obviously you need to get the, the hand measurements, and so there's uh, either cotton gloves, um, which we like to see warm beneath gloves. Um, for um, rather than having to make an assumption about the effectiveness of gloves, it's better to have a measurement under the hand based on real use. And uh, also, there's uh, various washes that can be used to remove the pesticides of the uh, subject. Jeff, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, you, you showed the suit that you're trying to measure the exposure to the skin, the dosimetry. Yeah. You didn't include the head or the feet. Coming up. Okay. We have the. Uh, the wipe technique, so we'll wipe the uh, face and neck and extrapolate to the rest of the, the head. Also, um, in a situation where we would have the chemical resistant headgear, we would have a patch on the inside and the outside, so we can have uh, estimations of exposure if you wore one or didn't. Um, and depending on the scenario, certainly the, the rights of way sprayer that you saw or the person using that um, um, small sort of uh, granular um, uh, application device, um, socks would be used to measure the feet there. Um, but in a situation where if we were going to do a study with a closed system, uh, someone sitting in an enclosed cab, we would probably not measure the feet. But uh, in, in situations where we feel the, the exposure is uh, very, very likely for, you know, getting in through the socks and things like that, we would um, we would use sock dosimeters. That's a good point. And uh, the OVS tube, obviously, for uh, measuring the concentration of the pesticides in the breathing zone. So uh, we can measure people inside cabs. Uh, if they're wearing respirators, it really doesn't matter because we'll have an ability to capture the residues that are in their breathing zone regardless of uh, whether or not they're using a respirator or not. And you know, here's an example of just it being attached to a subject's um, belt and you know wrapped around. And you know, uh, in the newer studies, we're we're definitely not interested in showing um, anything that could identify the subject. So, but trust me, that tube's going up into uh, the breathing zone of that person. So, um, whether they wore a respirator or not, we know what they're exposed to um, if they didn't wear one. And so. You know, those studies, uh, the people will be outfitted like I just described, and there will be a number of them performing a specific scenario. And by that, I mean air blast applicator um, wearing perhaps a single layer of their, you know, typical work clothes um, and gloves. And uh, for each person, we'll uh, measure the amount of active ingredient that they, uh, they handled, and we'll develop what we call the urine exposure, which is a pretty simple metric of milligrams exposure per pound AI handled for that specific scenario, again, for perhaps air blast using, um, you know, uh, chemical resistant gloves. And so, um, you know, we'll sum all those up, generally use the arithmetic mean from those data, and uh, we'll plug that into our um, exposure assessment. Um, and it's pretty simple. Uh, we'll get the unit exposure from PHED or the new uh, Ag Handler's Exposure Database or other databases that we use for uh, various uh, scenarios. Uh, we know the application rate that came from the label. Uh, we have a pretty good idea on uh, the types of acres that can be treated in a day based on the types of equipment. Um, 
if it's a dermal um, uh, value that we're interested in and it's an oral study that we're measuring it against, we'll have some estimate of dermal absorption. Uh, factor in the body weight and again come up with our MOE, uh, which tells us whether or not that particular scenario is um, going to meet our safety standards or not. Um, and so we've got uh, lots of them, uh, and we're getting even more, um, and that's going to be, in my view anyway, better data based on just the overall sort of study design and uh, you know, good sample sizes and all that. Uh, and also using uh, the more uh, modern equipment. Uh, a lot of those studies of PhD go back to, well, back to when I was in that study, you know, late 80s, uh, 90s, uh, back in those days. So a lot of a lot of things have changed, although some things uh, haven't changed all that much. Um, again, we want to have surrogate data values with uh, PPE. Uh, gloves, obviously, is, is the number one uh, thing as far as we're concerned. That That is the most bang for the buck in terms of mitigation. Uh, protective headgear is very, very uh, crucial, especially for orchards, and uh, we're finding for um, the uh, uh, nursery and greenhouse applications. Um, we don't have data currently for coveralls, uh, but we'll use protection factors uh, for the covered areas. And again, aprons, uh, we don't assume any protection factors at all. We're happy people wear them, um, and we feel they're mostly for gross spills and things like that. Um, and respirators, we assume, have protection factors. Um, here's just a breakdown of uh, a unit exposure for mixing and loading. And I think what's nice, at least from my perspective as an exposure assessor, is that you get to see um, you know, where the exposure is. And I think it really does help help uh, inform your, uh, you know, your risk management decisions. And uh, I think you can see pretty simply the take home message here would be that, you know, using gloves is a pretty, a pretty good, um, pretty good way to mitigate exposure. Um, we'll generally run them an exposure assessment without gloves just so people know what the risk would be if people didn't wear them. Uh, the no clothing, I guess, is a rather unfortunate designation, but that's uh, just simply saying that uh, we're not assuming that there's any protection afforded by the clothing. Um, we've used those uh, typically for situations where uh, there's a World Health Organization treatment somewhere or there's uh, some sort of spray situation in a, um, maybe Sri Lanka or something like that where we're not sure how much clothing is worn. We might use a value like that to, to make an assessment. Um, this is a, just a, a table sort of showing some of the differences that you might uh, expect. I mean, some of these things are intuitive. Uh, Water-soluble packets, unit exposure is quite low, uh, obviously, compared to uh, open mixing loading. So um, these are all the kinds of things that um, are, go into uh, our exposure assessment, really depending on the use. And so. Um, Here's the typical table you might see in an exposure assessment. Um, so starting on the left, you'd have the uh, unit, ex unit exposures that were used. Um, I think in this case, they're probably all from uh, PHED. Um, there's the application rate um, next uh, from the label and our assumptions about uh, the acres treated per day. Um, and then you'll have the uh, short and intermediate term um, exposures. Uh, uh, exposure for uh, with and without gloves, um, and again, um, also the inhalation exposure. And then all the way over on the right, you'll have the combined, I think in this case, uh, the, all the effects were the same, so they combine the exposure from all the routes and come up with um, uh, an exposure value for all routes. And so in this case, uh, on the top there, if you didn't wear gloves, um, your MOE was 37, obviously issues there. Uh, but if you wear gloves, um, you might be well above the uh, level of concern that was identified uh, by the toxicologists. And so, um, you know, again, depending on the chemical and the uses and, you know, apples and oranges, there may be different application rates and um, uh, these tables can get fairly long and we'll do one uh, for uh, uh, single layer, uh, single with gloves. We'll do, we'll take it out as far as uh, we need to go to get 
to the point where the risk managers are satisfied with uh, the uh, uh, MOEs, or in uh, the case of cancer, the, the risks. Um, just again, emphasizing that point, um, again, these things can be fairly extensive, um, or they can be pretty uh, short, depending on uh, what's really seen in that database, uh, how much is applied, and um, what the circumstances are. Um, and just to kind of, uh, just sort of show what what the data kind of indicate as far as, um, you know, again, why we think gloves are so important for mixing loading. Um, uh, you can really see the, uh, without gloves, um, you know, if you have a granular formulation, it might not have as big of an impact, but certainly wettable powders or liquids, it's got a, a much, much bigger impact. Um, uh, as, as shown in this example, uh, single layer uh, without gloves and then single layer with gloves. Um, this example just assumed a 10% thermal absorption. I think an important thing to remember there is if um, thermal absorption is, if it's really low, suddenly inhalation becomes much, much more important. And if you've got a hot chemical, um, your inhalation um, route becomes much, much more important. So sort of just marching it through, again, um, you know, the single layer, um, you know, gets you so far. Um, and the double layer, that's where the coveralls come in, um, doesn't really get you that much. Uh, that's why we tend to single layer gloves. We may consider coveralls um, if it's uh, issues of feasibility emerge, but then there's also heat stress. And, uh, and the like uh, is this something that's used in the middle of summer and not likely to be worn. Uh, the next one is the double layer and the protection factor um, for the various types of respirators. And then finally, the engineering controls. So just to kind of put in perspective um, the impact of uh, various um, decisions that one can go through uh, when you're evaluating the PPE. And again, uh, thermal absorption is a really important factor. Um, and if uh, something is poorly absorbed, then it really becomes more and more important to, to be confident in your inhalation assessments. Um, for worker reentry, um, it's similar methods. I've only got a couple of slides on this, but I just wanted to make sure that it was uh, touched. Uh, we have thermal contact factors that we call transfer coefficients, and those are kind of based on um, a lot of uh, activities uh, such as uh, harvesting apples or sweet corn, scouting, you know, hoeing weeds and row crops, things like that. Uh, but the key thing to remember for worker reentry, and this is, again, field workers, is that we don't use PPE to mitigate exposure. Uh, the only thing with, that we do use to mitigate exposure is um, time after spraying or uh, anything else uh, like that, maybe lowering your application rates, uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit of a minute there. Um, so here's just an example of um, kind of study that's used to uh, develop the transfer coefficients. Again, workers in fields performing those activities, and um, again, we would uh, estimate uh, based on data uh, that registrants submit. Um, on the decline or half-lives of the pesticides in the fields to determine whether or not um, it's safe to go in uh, at various days after an application. Um, our website has uh, uh, two really nice places that you can see the handler data that we use in our exposure assessments, and then also for the uh, workers, we have the transfer coefficients at those uh, at those two sources. Those are definitely worth checking out. Uh, highly recommended. So this is where our break was, but I think we're just going to keep on rolling uh, in the interest of time and get into risk management. Um, I think for us, it all begins and ends with the label, uh, certainly for our risk assessment purposes, and that's kind of where everything that we get decided uh, is going to be seen by the person that, that uh, it's designed to help. Um, and so, you know, um, we've got some nice words about here, meeting statutory standards, and, uh, 
the key thing here is that uh, it's a uh, standard is no unreasonable adverse effects on human health or the environment, um, and that uh, it's a pretty open process. Um, things uh, get decided um, uh, in a fairly open process. There's uh, federal registers, there's uh, the stakeholder meetings, um, and the more uh, complicated it gets, uh, the, the more involved it gets. Um, just a little bit of uh, legalese 101. Um, anybody who works in the government knows that uh, Congress, uh, they decide, they make statutes, and then us agencies have to figure out what the regulations are and issue policy statements, and that uh, they're legally binding. They're certainly legally binding on us, and so are the regulations. Um, it gets a little bit more, more loose when you have policies, but that can also get you in trouble, so you need to be pretty clear on your policies. And um, if people don't agree with us, then uh, they take us to court, and then it becomes even more fun. Um, so the ethical statutes for us, um, there's the Food Quality Protection Act that um, many people have heard, and that certainly involves the dietary and assessing risks um, from all sources of exposure in addition to dietary. Um, the one that really impacts uh, the handler exposure is uh, FIFRA. Uh, and that's uh, under which the registered um, products are evaluated and uh, our whole reevaluation process. Uh, the PREA up there is the uh, Pesticide uh, Registration Improvement Act. It's, uh, it's a fee for service now, so you know we're um, we're getting a little bit of money for what we do now from the um, registrants, and so um, that's an interesting factor on uh, deadlines and all that kind of uh, stuff. Um, uh, but the key thing about FIFRA is um, is that it requires uh, risk and benefit balancing. The the, uh, the Food Quality Protection Act that doesn't enter the picture. So the uh, the, the, way, the weighing of risks and benefits. Um, if the margins of exposure are less than your level of concern, but there's a very very important use, uh, there's a process uh, that they go through to determine whether or not. Uh, the benefits would, uh, you know, exceed the risks or, or vice versa. Um, again, trying to maintain the standard that uh, no unreasonable adverse effects are uh, caused by the decision. Um, remembering again that the label is the law and that uh, the enforcement uh, is uh, primarily through the states. Um, Again, just uh, sort of showing that uh, we're all sort of all in it together, and uh, risk characterization is probably the most important thing that we do in our health effects division, and the, uh, the benefits analysis is uh, really, really critical uh, when you get into a chemical that's got risks of concern, but uh, it's also widely, uh, widely used in agriculture. It can be a very long process. Um, and so here's just some, uh, you know, some, some more kind words on risk management. I think in the interest of time, I might get down to um, a slide or two that I really think kind of gets to um, the process in a nutshell. I know I had shown these to Kim and uh, Dennis, and I think it took me about what, two or three hours to finally uh, explain it because it's fairly involved, but. They didn't have the benefit of this uh, this slideshow, so what I'd like to do is just kind of um, get on to it because I think, as this slide says, it's I think you probably always hear uh, from from people here anyway that it's a case by case basis. Um, all chemicals are different, um, and you need to kind of look at things deliberately. Um, and so here it is. It's um, it looks simple to me, but probably for the first time you see it, it's a little bit crazy. But if we start on the top left, uh, our handler risk assessment, um, as I hope I tried to describe anyway, um, we, uh, the assessors identify the exposure scenarios, right? So you'll go through the label and you'll check out um, all the potential uses. Uh, you'll evaluate all the handheld equipment uh, and the like, and then you're going to evaluate that PPE that's on those labels. Um, you're going to see if you need a respirator or not. You're going to see if um, 
uh, closed cabs or some sort of closed mixing loading systems required, uh, whether or not the gloves are going to work, whether or not coveralls are going to help any. Um, you go through, uh, you evaluate all your data. There may be PHED data or the new task force data. There might be a chemical specific study. It might involve biological monitoring. All those things can kind of factor into uh, your ultimate uh, decision. Um, you're going to then um, uh, estimate your margins of exposure. And uh, in the simple case of uh, single use, if the you know, margin of exposure is more than 100, and um, you know, that's your level of concern, uh, you're done. You know, the decision is made. Uh, the final label is, uh, you know, mentioned in the uh, Federal Register, and, and the deal is done. Um, but often that's not the case. Uh, you have margins of exposure less than 100, and so that's when um, the work becomes very interesting. Um, you have to start uh, looking at your data, how, how how strong do you feel about your assessment? How much confidence do you have in it? What do you feel about the effects of the chemical? What about that dose spacing in the no L's and low L's? Uh, what information would you need uh, to uh, make a better uh, uh, informed decision? Would you need another study? Would you need another toxicity study? Uh, would it be some sort of condition of registration? Or would they have to hold up that registration? All those things are. Uh, decided by um, the risk managers. Off on the bottom and to the right, that's where, um, if, particularly if there's risk of concern and there's an indication that um, there's a need for a chemical, um, you have the benefits of uh, using a pesticide. Um, <clears throat> mitigation strategies might might include changing PPE, or it might. Uh, involve reducing application rates. Maybe the gloves would work fine if the application rate was two pounds per acre instead of four. Uh, the question is, will that um, will that application rate work for the pests that need to be controlled? There might be a change in pesticide applications. It might be something that could be injected into the soil rather than sprayed to the foliage. Um, there's a number of things that could be uh, worked through um, that process, and that's involved with our other divisions, uh, particularly the uh, benefits uh, folks. There's also just the, the feasibility of, is it, is it actually going to work? Are people going to wear those coveralls? Is it possible to drive a closed cab in an orchard in the Pacific Northwest? Um, how do the registrants feel? How do the farm worker advocates uh, feel about it? How do the uh, grower groups feel? Uh, all those things are, are done um, under the risk management process, and uh, ultimately uh, they'll come to a final regulatory decision. And sometimes, after all that's done, someone might call me up and say, "How did such and such label get um, such and such PPE on it?" and it might be because of all those things. So um, that, I think, in a nutshell, is the story. And I think at this point, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, other than to say that there's a similar, um, perhaps confusing process for post-application, where you evaluate all the post-application processes, um, and it's the same drill. Um, how do you feel about your assessment? Uh, how do you feel about the endpoints and points of departure that were selected? Um, how hazardous is it? And all those kinds of things. And what can we do to mitigate and, uh, and the like? And so, uh, as I said, I'll be happy to take any uh, questions that you have at this time. Uh, so you'll just need to uh, submit your question using the Q&A tab. And uh, we'll take questions. I think we have a comment or a question in the room. Colleen from NIOSH. I would like to ask, um, when you're doing studies that involve human workers and handlers, does your agency require any kind of special pre-authorization? How does, how does that work, I mean, when you're going out to the field to collect your data? <laughs> um, uh, boy, that... That would be a whole day too, I think. But um, but there is something you are required. Yeah, there is there is something, and um, the, certainly um, we have guidelines. Number one, that that tell you how to go about doing it, um, and then there's um, 
we go through a human studies uh, review board. Okay, we have similar. That's why right, and so we take the protocol through that board, um, and they'll assess it for you know ethical concerns and scientific integrity, and then when the data come back, uh, we take the results to them. So is this a you know years long process? Monitoring? Yeah, yeah, several years actually to develop a database. Um, I think we started. Um, I'm really not sure when, probably, you know, sort of the early, maybe 2002, 2003, something like that. So, and we're still, you know, uh, I'm taking a protocol to the board next week, um, and it'll take probably two years for that study to come in. And when it does, then we'll take it to them, you know, get it on the schedule. So, yeah, you're probably looking at three years' time by the time you envision something and actually start using it. Okay, thank you. Sure. This is Nadia. I would like to ask you in the risk assessment procedure that you described, do you use any biological data? Blood, um, uh, if it's you mean biological monitoring? Either. I'm sorry? Do you use any biological data to determine the risk assessment, or just do you depend on the surface exposure? Um, if there are chemical-specific um, um, biological monitoring data for handlers, it would be considered, yes. Okay. Uh, but it is not it is not required or depends on the type of chemical? It, well, yeah, it's not, re it's not required. Um, it's an option that registrants have, and it usually does uh, get used when um, you want to really refine the exposure assessment. You want to narrow it down to a more specific use. Um, and if you're not particularly confident, maybe in the dermal absorption data, uh, and if and you mean you also really know need to know an awful lot about the metabolites and confidence in capturing them. And then, but most of the time you are using the surface data. Surface data with um, and then comparing them either to uh, a route specific study like a dermal. Uh, toxicity study, uh, in which case we wouldn't make any assumptions about dermal absorption, or if it was a normal study, then we would use uh, either an estimate or um, maybe uh, dermal absorption data from an animal study or um, maybe okay. uh, some other source. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, we have a question from Steve. Steve, can you go ahead and star six your phone, please? Yeah, this is uh, Steve. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think you may have already addressed this question, but I was going to ask what was uh, your timeline from beginning to the end on uh, determining the PPE process? And then I'm going to follow that up with another question as to uh, uh, once this is all set and the product goes out onto the market and uh, it, you find that the PPE isn't adequate, does that ever happen and uh, what's the process in uh, changing that? Um, I think the, well, to the first one, I think, let's say, uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, the red, you know, maybe after the red was finalized, the, the PPE might make it to the labels a year or two after that if it has happened. Um, if it's a registration action and it's fairly straightforward, it would be obviously much, much quicker than that because you're kind of dealing it as, as it's coming in versus something that's existing. Um, I think the whole thing about how good a job we did is is really the piece of the puzzle that's uh, most interesting to us as far as how are we going to deal with that in the future. And, and we, I think this is where the, the outreach stuff that I think Kim is doing, um, so we have better information, are people even doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, Kevin Keeney's group and the Worker Protection Standard um, branch, would they, is there something that they can do on training? Um, the epi data, like the egg health study, um, are, we, are we missing some toxic effect? So I think those things are, they're sort of part of the puzzle. And it's also part of the reason why um, all chemicals are on a track to be reevaluated every 15 years. I, I'm, 
I imagine it might be better to to do so more often than 15 years, but that's certainly the thinking behind that. So it's not perfect, um, but it's a start, and um, and we are thinking about ways to how do you how do you figure out you did a good job or not? Did that help any? Yeah, that answered the question. Thank you. Okay, we're still open for questions. Well, we have uh, we have a question from Teresa. Uh, can you go ahead and start six, please, and get your question? Teresa, can you go ahead and start six? We're all waiting. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. go right ahead. Please. Okay, great. Um, yes, I just had a question on whether EPA maintains data on um, situations where um, maybe the recommended PPE was worn, but there was some type of PPE failure resulting in health effects. Is that captured in the database anywhere? That um in HCD, not necessarily, but that's something that might be uh, found in the incident data. Okay. So is that a database that's, like, searchable and you could search for gloves and, and, and find reports where, you know, um, that information would be, you know, captured? I don't know if it's that easy to search. Oh. Um, I think and there's the, the various databases are different. Um, so, I, and again, it's, that's not something I do specifically, but... I can um, I can research that question a little more and shoot my answer off to Kim. Would that be a way to? That would be great because Dash that? does have some work groups going on looking at conformity. Yeah, um, I'm in. Are you, you in know, that? <laughs> I know that? I'm not. I'm not. But you never know what you get dragged into. So um, you might be dragged into this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that would be great. I'm on the and, and your name again is? I'm sorry. Teresa Seitz. S E I T Z. And it's okay. our surveillance subgroup that's looking at sources of data for PPE failures and things of that nature. Yeah, see, I think this would be, you know, I think this is part of that. I think I had a slide up about how, you know, we could all sort of work together, and this would be something that, that we would be very important for us to know. Right. Great. Great, thanks. Sure. Okay, we have another question, Jeff, from, from Roy. Roy, can you go ahead and star six, please? Take your question. Hey, Roy, star six, please, and go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great job. This was very interesting. Thank you. Will this presentation be available for download? Yes. Yes, it will. Go okay, because I didn't see it on the website. I know I saw Chapter 10 there. There were a few other documents. Okay, what we're going to do, um, we're going to review the recordings and make sure they're um, that they're uh, in good quality, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll circulate those via an email in about a week. Okay, great. Hmm? Thank you. Sure, no problem. And I see no more questions at this time through live meeting. Okay, good. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for participating.